open my heart up to share with you my testimony, I felt the grace immediately. I just felt the grace of God that's been upon my life. I felt the touching, the, um, the love and um, the shepherding. You know, the the scripture says that he, that he leaves the 99 for the one. And I believe, you know, it's, um, certainly something like that happened to me. And I'm going to tell you a bit about my story. So I remember back in the 90s, I mean, I grew up in a Catholic background. Uh, I went to Catholic school. Um, so I knew God. I knew God was. I was taught about God. My household come from a West Indian background. Um, prayers and, and, and God was always talked about in my life. We went to church on a Sunday, you know, and um, it was very prevalent in my life. And I remember something happened very significant when I was a child. Um, I loved. Um, I grew up in a, in a, in a one parent family. There was. Um, Five of us in the home. My mum also um, took on another three kids, so there was eight of us. We lived in a two, uh, two to three bedroom place in East London, and it was really, really uh, challenging at that time. Really challenging at a time because I was the youngest, you know, and everybody used to say, "Well, what do you know?" So, hence the reason. If you know that I'm a bit loud, you know why I'm a bit loud, because I always used to have to fight and crash and really get myself across, you know, to be heard, you know, and I've learned a lot about this stuff through the work that I've done on myself over the years. <laughs> and, um, you know, we grew up in this place in East London, it was tough, it was in the city, and you had to learn how to handle yourself, you know, my mum was kind of like a bit of a tough nut, you know, she was, um, she didn't play games, you know, she'd give it to you where, where you had to give it to you. She told you she was, you know, in fact, I watched my mum grow up in the in, in the seventies, you know, fighting for her kids. You know, I grew up in in, in places in, in East London, they were quite racist. You know, I, I saw my mum really fighting her way through to protect us. You know, that's what I saw. And I was I was quite terrified as a kid, to be fair. I was terrified growing up. I was terrified about you know the things around me. But I saw this I saw this woman who was a fighter, you know, and 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 I idolized everything about her because everything every I was the type of kid was the mummy's boy so I would particularly shepherd it being the youngest I was around my mum 24 7 so I was like this I was just watching everything that she did and she was aggressive she was a fighter she was tough she didn't play games and you, you, you know and I was kind of like half protected around her. Do you know what I mean? I was like this little mummy's boy. Do you know what I mean? And it was a privilege. You know, this this was my privilege as a child growing up, being this little mummy's boy. You know, I could always run to my mum. Anything that I shouted, anything that happened in the house, the first words that would come out of my house was, Mum! That's what I'd shout. Mum! Mum! Him! Mum! 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 So you can imagine, mum was the first word that really kind of like was sewed into my heart. It was the first idol. We wouldn't talk about idols. You know, my mum was my idol. You know, there was, it, 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 it was like peas and pods. She was like an idol to me. And of course, you know, my mum divorced my, my, my dad um, and she had a huge resentment. I mean, I didn't even know what a resentment was, but she had a huge resentment against my dad and she fested on it. You know, she was like, your dad is this, your dad is that. She told me everything about my dad, 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 dad. And in my head, you know, there was part of me, you know, and this is why we got to be careful what we sow into it. There's part of me, you know, I didn't really know my dad. You know, I, I met him a few times. Um, I grew up, uh, I grew up knowing him. And, and 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 to be fair, you know, as a kid, I wasn't particularly interested in him, you know, because I was so shepherded and protected by my mum. I fed off everything that she said. Like I said, she was my idol. I fed. So she would say, your dad was this. And I would like withdraw. Your dad was this. Your... But I was a curious. I was very, very curious, particularly when I was young, when I didn't have, when I couldn't do anything. But as I got older, 
I started to be more curious and I started to ask more questions. And, you know, one day, you know, I was uh, I was in a car. I was about five years of age. You know, I, I struck up a very, very uh, good relationship with my uncle at this time because I was searching for uh, uh, male model figures. I had enough of them in my household around my brothers. Um, and I, um, I had enough of them in my household around my brothers. And this was the first real male model figure uh, that I found in my life, which was my mum's um my mum's uncle uh, and <clears throat> he was great do you know what I mean I remember as a young kid I'd sit on his lap and he'd used to give me alcohol and I remember tentatively that I would sit on his lap to go and get drink I loved it you know it was the first ease and comfort that I ever had in my life do you know what I mean that I didn't know what was going on there was so much going on around this household it was like it was insane it was in it was madness you know growing up in them times you know it was kind of like really insane but I found that little bit of comfort by going and sit on my uncle's lap and getting this bit of alcohol and and, and everyone would say whoa what are you doing to the boy and they, 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 they go, let's give the boy some drink you know go away and it was quite normal amongst the west indian background to kind of like drink and everybody get drunk and you know that would be it you know every weekend you know there'd, there'd always be someone around it always be a party do you know what i mean so i kind of like grew up in that that kind of like loud environment party environment drink alcohol let's yeah music da da and, it, and, it, and I'd find myself sitting on my uncles and also at this point in time, I like, you know, I'd go round to family members' houses, you know, so I was a child that was always going around to family members' houses, you know, and I'd be seeing different things around different families. So I'd go to auntie's here and I'd think, oh, you know, they look a bit complete, mum, dad, children, looks all good. You know, I'd always be looking at the things that they had and the things that we never had and compare it and always be in myself about it. I never spoke about these things, but I thought, something's not quite right here. I don't know what it is, but that looks different. And particularly when I went round to, you know, some of my wealthy families, particularly my uncle, uh, my auntie Stephanie, I used to love going around her house. She had a big garden. You know, all the kids looked, had big, massive rooms. There was loads of toys everywhere, you know, and it just looked all so great and fantastic, you know. So I was always checking out different families. So this particular night when we went to one of our family's house, there was about five carloads in this particular um, um, event and we left the house and they was all drunk and they was all drink driving and they was all drunk. And um, I wanted to sit on my uncle's lap as usual, uh, but I wanted to sit on my uncle's lap at this time in the front of the car. Uh, there was a big argument. It must have went on for about five minutes. And I said, no, I'm not coming to you, mum. I'm staying with uncle. I'm staying with uncle. And this went on for about five, six minutes um, before my mum literally dragged me from the front of the car, literally dragged me. And I was kicking, screaming, crying. And I, was, I remember I was held in, in, in my mum's arms whilst the journey of this particular um, environment of a convoy of cars was moving forward about 20 minutes into that journey there was a huge car crash the car that I was in um, um, crashed my uncle went straight through the windscreen uh, and died uh, within a few hours later um, and uh, I was in trauma for about four or five days I was in complete trauma because I knew what happened about uh, a few hours before that particular accident that I was kicking and screaming, dragged from the front seat of that car um, into the back with me, mum, and um, I wasn't dead. I went to the uh, morgue at the time. I was only about five or six. Uh, I spent about maybe an hour in that morgue looking at uh, my uncle. And at that time, I remember very, very clearly the Holy Spirit kind of like really kind of like said to me, you're lucky that should have been you and it stayed with me it stayed with me for the rest of my life that presence in that room in that morgue you know looking at my uncle looking at him plain as day as it was down there you know there was there was, the spirit was saying to me that ain't you it's just you it's for a reason 
I didn't know what it was, but I knew I was very, very lucky. I knew the hand of God was on me straight away. I knew that was in a personal encounter. I knew the whole scenario behind that whole thing because I knew God, yeah. I wasn't into it, but I used to go to church. I knew God. I had a relationship with God. Do you know what I mean? You know, I knew God was love. I used to sing great songs. You know what I mean? Da, da, da. So I knew for a fact, you know, God had his hand on my life from that, that, from that particular time then. I remember growing up through that encounter and, um, you know, um, being settled and, you know, I, I see the things that my mum done, you know, by this po point in time, we grew up, you know, we end up in in, 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 a, in a great house in East London, you know, it's a four or five bedroom house, you know, and them times in the seventies, you know, that, that house today is worth about 1.5 to maybe 2 million pounds, you know, so my mum did pretty well to get us from where we was from bed sits in, in, in South East London. And I always say to her, thank God you never brought me up in South East London, mum. Yeah. Um, to move into East London where I grew up in Bethnal Green and um, you know you know it was kind of it was, it was like how did the niggers get this house you know basically like that and it was um, you know NF used to be sprayed over our walls and things like that our windows used to get broken and um, again you know by this time of growing up you know uh, I had to kind of like you know change my mindset you know by this time it was like right I now need to fight I need to fight my way. I've seen my mum fight along the way, and this is how I need to be. I need to fight my way to kind of like stand up for myself because my mum was a type of woman. Anything they do you, you do them back. If they hit you, you hit them back. Don't let no one bully you. Don't let no one terrorise you. So I become a bit of a terroriser. You know, I was like, I've got to stand up for myself. You know, if I didn't stand up myself, I'd have to answer to my older brothers. If I didn't stand up to myself, I'd have to answer to my mum. So kind of like what was ingrained in me was I need to fight. So in school, I became a bit of a troublemaker. I became a bit of a bully. I became, you know, um, someone who was just, you know, so angry, resentful, didn't even know what was going on, didn't even have a clue, but was just full of this rage as a kid and basically transferred that into the outside, in school, into, you know, with his teachers. I went into that rebellion. I went, uh, that's basically where I went into. I went into a, 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 a rebellious stage, particularly when I hit secondary school. Because I remember walking into secondary school and uh, I was the last of four boys going into that school. And, you know, my assembly was, my assembly uh, amongst, I don't know, maybe about two, uh, however, however, however many hundred children was, oh, this is the last of the Emmanuel. And it was like, right, I was, I'm going to show you last of the Emmanuels, basically. That's pretty what, you know, how my head, you know, viewed this. And I rebelled all the way through that school. Uh, you know, I got into criminality from then, you know, I started going into Woolworths, filling up my sports bag with, you know, with 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 loads of chocolates and, and sweets, you know, bringing in free bags, setting up tuck shops, you know, earning money, thinking I was really, really bad. My brother used to work um, for uh, um, a clothing manufacturer up in Brick Lane. And, you know, I used to steal clothes out there and sell them on the streets. And by the end of 13, 14, uh, I, I didn't go to school. I left school. I didn't do not one exam. I didn't do nothing. You know, I rebelled against it because, you know, the words that was in my head, the words that was in my head was you will account to nothing. You will never do anything. You will, you, 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 you know, you're going to end up doing this. Do you know what I mean? All I end up from, 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 from year one to year four was you would never end up. Yeah, the, the, and I kind of like got to the point where I said, well, like that really in so many words, it was like, right, that's it. Then I'm gone. And, Again, all of this, I was this scared young boy. Didn't know what I was doing. I was terrified, but I was full of this ball of rage. And I know now today this rage and this anger was a place where it kind of like kept me from being um, in that place of, you know, fear. I challenged my fear with my anger. I challenged my fear with my fuel of resentment. You know, I, I, I was one of those kids that had not one chip, but two chips on their shoulder. I'd use my race and ethnicity against everything because I was black. I could blame that one. All of that sort of stuff. I, you know, I knew half the things that was going on. I was learning, you know, all the wrong ways, all the wrong things from all the wrong characters. I was following all the wrong, all the wrong models and, and I was getting into trouble and doing all the wrong things. 
and of course by about 14 15 you know i was i was uh, 14 i was smoking by 15 16 i was using drugs i was using glue and all those things and all that before that I, my first addiction was money that and that came long before anything um you know i i i knew about addiction chocolate money you know uh, anger uh, power uh, prestige all these things i'd learned around my addiction until i found drugs you know one day i was cleaning my, my, my brother's car i was 15 years of age i had loads of friends i was cleaning his back cleaning the back of his car because i'd always clean his car and do all these things to get paid you know and i found a big 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 bag of coke big big bag of coke and i thought wow here we go in my head when i found this coke was i'm gonna nick some I'm going to go and get all my mates and then we're going to go and have a right party and I'm going to be him, Greg. So I nicked some. And, and then when I try to nick some, I nicked about seven grand, something like that. It was a big, it was a big lung. I put it back. Do you know what I mean? I went straight to Wonka next door, who was my next door neighbor. Before we know it, we had a party, we had music going around, everybody else. I'm a 15-year-old child. And I was like, wow, this is it. No wonder that, that Greg's always out. And this is why Greg's, you know, always out with his friends. And, and this is why. And it was like, I want to be like Greg. So I confronted Greg straight away, you know. I said, right, Greg, listen, um, listen, I've, I've seen what's in the back of your car. Do you know what I mean? X, Y, Z, you know, um, I'm, I need to, I want to be with you. And like, Greg was like, me and Greg grew up very, very, very tight as, as a young, as young children. You know, I come, I'll tell you a little bit, a little bit more before I go into this. Um, there was only two of us when, when I grew up in East London and over the years, you know, by the time I was five, six, seven and eight, you know, I, I'm, my mum sent for my oldest brother that was in the West Indies. So he came over. So there was three of us. The mum then sent for my other brother, who I didn't know about, from the West Indies. He came over a year later. And then my mum sent over for my sister in the West Indies. So we went from two to five. Do you know what I mean? As a family, you know, and then my mum took on, you know, Rupert and Lenny, who... My uncles died, their children, so there were seven of us. But this happened over a period of years. So you can imagine, I'm like two, three, four, five. Now, my brothers who came over from the West Indies, you know, it was a big transition for them and my sister. So they kind of like looked to me and my brother to kind of like, you know, help them, stabilise them, tell them about England, tell them about, you know, some of the things that was happening. They come from the West Indies. We was also intrigued about the West Indies, so we used to ask questions, but we used to think they was alien compared to us because, like, they'd say, like, they'd come from a little village, there was no water there, you know, they'd run around, and then da, 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 and we'd just think, wow, kind of like even our luxuries and the things that we didn't have, and there was kind of like a little bit of, Oh, you know we were better than but then it was kind of like it was this thing of this integration between the, this west indian and english culture between us and grooming that and it was strange at times there was lots of fights there was lots of arguments you can imagine this settling up in this household was absolutely insane but my mum did it somehow she she was on a mission to bring her family together you know and she did it and she was quite pleased about that um and it was a bit of a victory for her. So by the time I was, as I was about 15, 16, you know, got into drugs, you know, by this time, you know, all of my family, apart from my sister, was in drugs. My brother smoked, my older brother drank, Greg was into cocaine, I was into cocaine, Dexter was into cocaine. Then we obviously went into this nightlife. Then that went spiraled out of control. Then prison jails and all that sort of stuff coming in. And the shame of it all and my mum got so bad that she left the country. She left the country to go back home. She couldn't deal with the shame. She she felt like she brought up all these kids. You know, she, she spent all her life, you know, trying to do everything for her kids. And all of them ended up on drugs. You know, robbing, stealing, ended up in jail, all that sort of stuff. And she went back to St. Lucia. When she went back to St. Lucia, that was the worst thing that ever, that ever could have happened. I was about um, 
1819, um, the, 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 the the house became a crack house. Um, and, you know, I got introduced to criminal, criminality in a big way, you know, guns, all this sort of stuff uh, started getting into play. I was out of my depth. I knew I was out of my depth. I'd saw my brother go into prison, in and out of prison. Um, I'd be, you know, running his business. Um, I'd see my mum protecting us in so many different ways, you know, over the years. And, I, and of course, I've now got this big drug problem. And, um, you know, at the age of 27, I went into a treatment centre. I went into a place called Cloud's House. And um, it was a game changer for me. Uh, um, I learned about, you know, getting clean. And um, I learned about a little bit about myself. I learned about, you know, kind of like being around people. Uh, I learned about my attitude. I learned about lots of things. You know, it's kind of like being taught all over again at the age of 20, 27. You know, uh, my mum taught me a lot of things, but she, one of the things that, she, that nobody ever taught me about was myself. And in this treatment centre, I got to learn a bit about who I was, where I come from, the family dynamics, you know, doing life stories, you know, being in group therapy and all this sort of stuff. And I was kind of like intrigued by it. I found recovery. You know, I found recovery and uh, I was literally blown away by it. I was really kind of like, you know, when I left that place in, 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 in Salisbury, I came back to London. I wanted to go back to London. I was so pleased about it. I had me, I had me, um, me, me, me blue book which was my uh, my basic text. And uh, I left that um, treatment centre with a basic text and a Bible. And I went to a second stage treatment centre in um, in southwest London. And in that place, you know, I grew up and I, I honestly grew up, you know, uh, again, um, I started to reconnect with God. But, you know, I was mainly on, a, 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 you know, just getting clean 12 step. You know, I was a 12 step Nazi, as they called me. You know, uh, you know, I found a lovely sponsor, you know, who was, who was um, you know, 10 years clean at the time. You know, he, he smashed me through the steps. You know, he's like a bit of a father figure. You know, that man still um, sponsors me today. Uh, and, uh, you know, he kind of like love me like you know I didn't know how to love myself you know and it was again a reconnection and a re-engaging with a male connection and this guy wasn't a Christian you know he was just a man you know who kind of like took me under his wing showed me a, a few things about myself you know my first step forward that I did you know really kind of like really opened my eyes up it was a therapy based step four um, and you know it made me go and ask questions to members of my family you know and I remember you know going and ask questions to my dad saying like well, one of the questions was, what time was you born? So I went to my dad and I found him out. I said, Dad, do you know what time I was born? And he couldn't answer. So I said, I knew you weren't there. I asked my mum. She was still in a bit of a daze. But it really kind of like helped me with the family jigsaw. And, and, it, and, it, and, and one of my missions was engaged to kind of like, you know, bring the family together back, ask questions, you know, get some of those missing answers that are going. And I really found it. I was on that step four for two years and it was the greatest thing that I ever achieved. In fact, I, I cherished it. I've still got it today somewhere. That first step four I ever written. But, but uh, what, what happened was at the end of it, there was two things. There was two things on that that was really, really, really prevalent. The first one was in my fears list was about going back to using and going back to to, to criminality and going back to doing the things that I wanted to do and dying that was in my fears list but and also within that it was also about you know my mum also dying so there was there was a whole huge affairs list. you know I'm, I'm 27 20 28 and 28 29 at this time and time you know my mum died at 52 so I kind of like um 52 53 I think she died 52 53 so I kind of like lived with that pretty much of, as a weight-in of two things. One, going back to using, which I did eventually, seven years ago. I'm seven years clean to, uh, last week. I was seven years clean. So I went back out into my madness of active, active addiction seven years ago. So inevitably that did happen 19 years later. <laughs> and my mum died um, another three years later than that, 23 years. So in that fears list, those, those two things were quite high up in there. <clears throat> And uh, when I used and went back out there after years, you know, lots of things happened when I was clean. You know, um, you know, I built up a lovely business. You know, um, I, uh, I kind of like made lots of amends. The, the, the amends I made to my mum was, I, you know, I purchased her a lovely house in St. Lucia, which is a pride and joy. It's called the White House. 
you know, still my pride and joy today. You know, I built that for, uh, from scratch in, in St. Lucia. I felt very, very proud about that. It's one of my proudest achievements because she could go home uh, and she went back home every day. And I kind of like made that amends to her, you know, when she left her house in St. Lucia and she felt she had to leave her house in St. Lucia uh, in England to go back. And this was a little um, two bedroom house that I built into a 10 bedroom house when it was a proud, pride and joy and it still stands today. And um, it was one of the greatest ever teams I ever had, you know, I built up a lovely business, you know, I, I you know, I, I was sponsoring loads of people, you know, I thank God I got baptized, you know, um, but I was kind of like, you know, still doing my own thing. I was still lost. I was still kind of like a very, very worldly character. I was still doing quite a lot of worldly things. I didn't really understand the things of Christ. Um, I wasn't, you know, uh, in Bible study. I wasn't in the word. I wasn't in prayer. I was one of those Christians that was a Christian by name, um, which, would, which would rely on God, would speak God when he was in trouble. All of those things, you know, it was always in my heart. It was always prevalent. It was always, it was always my go-to when I was in trouble it was the first thing I went went to but every time I got out of trouble I would never seek him I'd kind of like just do my own thing yeah you know, I'd pick up the bible every day I'd go to your church I'd put the money in the pot you know and on the other side of it you know I'd be you know this Mr Recovery 12 Steps sponsoring after the world you know what I mean taking people through the work you know doing lots of service you know kind of like it was all about that looking good that external stuff that outside stuff and and dressing up the outside you know I had one house that wasn't enough two houses that wasn't enough one car that wasn't enough two cars that wasn't enough you know uh, and, and in the end, that 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 spiraled out of control, you know, in my relationships. One partner that wasn't enough. What did you know? All the things that I used to do, you know, was in the world before I was a Christian became more prevalent as being a Christian, you know. So, and this is somebody that called himself a Christian all his life, but didn't understand the things of God, didn't understand the walk of God, didn't understand nothing of God. In fact, I was completely lost. But when I knew when I got um, clean this time round, I remember very, very, very clearly. I remember clearly, very, very clearly that on my, when I um, was in this treatment centre and um, uh, I was five weeks in and I knew God's hand was on my life because the things that happened in that relapse, in that five years, it was just like absolutely, uh, it's it like walking with walking through the shadow of the valley of death but fearing no evil. But the fearing no evil was based on two things. Nine times out of 10, because I was completely high on coke. Nine times out of 10, because I was completely deluded that God is going to help me and he's going to transform me and he's going to do all these things. And, you know, it doesn't matter because I've got my God with me. I felt super powerful because the only thing that I could hold on to in this place, in this madness, in this insanity was God's. You know, I was completely losing my mind. I was completely losing my faculties. You know, I was smoking and using daily to the, to the extremes. I was doing things that were seriously abnormal. And the only thing that kept me sane was my faith. It was the only thing that I could rely on. You know, it was like my heart is beating. Boom, 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 boom like that. Thinking I'm going to die. And I would, I would say, God help me to like slow my heart down. Everything was God, 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 in this madness, in this insanity. And I, and the only thing that was speaking, everybody was saying, you're going to die. You're going to end up in a nut house. You're going to end up dead. You're going to end up killed. You know, And I, all the only thing I kept on telling everyone was, no, it ain't because God's going to save me and God's going to get me out of this. And they'd look at me as I was in completely insane, completely gone. You know what I mean? And I held on to my faith. That was the only thing. And eventually I got myself into this rehab. Yeah, I begged myself into there. Do you know what I mean? Uh, things were th things were really caving down on me. Uh, I got myself into this rehab, and um, um, when I got myself into this rehab, um, I got myself clean. I ended up um, in this in this rehab. Uh, I ended up in the second stage in Luton, and I ended up in this place in Luton. And I thought, right, I need to go to church. Do you know, it's the first thing that I need to go to. In this second stage, you know, I was an uh, I was you know a, an NA soldier. There was no NA in there, and I thought, right, the first thing I need to go forget about NA and forget about C. I need to go to meetings, but I need to go to church first. I knew it was the first thing I needed to do, and I ended up in a place called Luton Christian Fellowship in um, Luton, and it was the first place where I kind of like reconnected and reengaged. 
back with the, the, the back with the Lord, you know, and, uh, you know, I ended up doing Bible studies, prayer meetings. Uh, and then, you know, it was the first point of call. And, you know, I ended up getting back into meetings and it was just fellowship and church. That was all I had. And the church couldn't do, they couldn't do any more for me. You know, they gave me rooms to do meetings. They gave me rooms to, to, to hold groups. They gave me rooms to do absolutely anything that I want. You know, I had a couple of churches in that time. I had a Catholic church and I had a, a, a um, um, uh, um, uh, what's, it, what's it called a, a Pentecostal church you know and they both give me the keys it was like God giving me the keys to, to the kingdom to do whatever I wanted to do and, and in that what we did was just fellowship we done meetings you know we brought people to church people were getting baptized it, you know I, I was running around Luton and they used to say look at this he, he'd gone off his nut you know he's going into town preaching the gospel you know what I mean running around like just shouting Jesus do you know what I mean and, you know everywhere I went was shouting Jesus shouting Jesus in meetings shouting Jesus in 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 in, in the town center you know you know I kind of like had this real baptism of the fire of the Holy Ghost and I was just going round you know what I mean just just shouting Jesus and I, I remember my wife do you know what I mean you know people they, they used to say to her stay away from him he's, he's, he's an absolute lunatic do you know what I mean and because you know she was she was around a few girls around at, at, at the time in Luton and uh, they'd go he, he just goes around shouting Jesus he's completely lost he's, he, he's a nutter and, and of course you know she was a bit of a nutter so she didn't listen to him anyway do you know what I mean and um <laughs> so so you, you can imagine. So we got together and it was like two nutters, you know, running around 12 step fellowship, you know, and uh, of course, as, 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 as two nutters do, one takes the lead and I was taking the lead. Didn't have a clue what we were doing, but we were just following. We were just following. And um, it was kind of like it was it was absolutely crazy. Uh, we was in love. We was, you know, all these things we was in sexual sin i knew all about this sort of stuff she didn't know nothing about it so i kind of like half shielded her about it but as we got into more of the word and more of the bible study you know i was kind of like said we need to get married <clears throat> we need to get married and we went to our church we went to our pastor funny enough at, at the time uh and say look um Jim is pregnant we need to get married and you know what he said to us he went what happened there? And uh, it was like, why do you want to do this? And it was like, da, 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 da. and it was really strange. The conversation was really, 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 really strange. It was like, and the Holy Spirit said, look, you've got to come away from that church. You've got to come away from that church. And um, luckily enough, you know, um, where Gemma was living at the time was a place called Shepherd. And you wouldn't believe this place in Shepherd. To the left, I mean, I couldn't believe it when I got there. To the left was the Catholic Church. And to the right, I mean, walking distance one minute was a Catholic Church. And walking distance one minute was a Church of England Church. Two churches in between where we lived. Literally one minute walking distance between each church. So you can imagine, at this time, I'm full of... Uh, guilt, remorse, all this sort of stuff. I'm in heavy conviction around uh, the walk that I'm in right now. I know in my path something's not right I've been you know you know I knew all about um, fornication and all this sort of stuff uh, and the walk that I was in and I knew I didn't really know how to do anything to be fair but I knew God would make a way for me and um, we got we started to get mentored by this young woman in this church and and it was she was um, a, um, a, ch a church she was a church warden and she'd come around, she'd pray with us, we'd tell her about our problems, we'd tell her about what we want to do, and we got into it, and um, she'd help us, little Church of England church, um, we walked away from the Catholic church, Gemma didn't like it in there, she said she didn't feel comfortable in there, and uh, we made it in, in this journey, in this little church, and we started opening up, telling about the things, they were praying with us, and all this sort of stuff, and then of course my mum died, well, my mum was dying, and we had to take her in, and we had to take her in to live with her. We didn't know what to do. We didn't know where to go. We had no money. We had no nothing. But God made a way. And he and he sent us to Wollaston in this place where we were, where we live, where we've been for the last, you know, nearly four and a half years. And we got married in there. Uh, um, we buried my mum in there. Um, we baptised our children in there. Uh, and now we hold meetings in there in Faith Walk. 
it's absolutely unbelievable. Um, we come under um, um, in that church a pastor who, who showed a lot of faith in us, um, the vicar, Adrian Morton, and um, he knew we were two lunatics who weren't right, but, you know, he showed a lot of faith in us and opened up his door, opened up his hearts to us and just helped us, you know, and um, we just grew. We just grew in the faith. We just grew in the faith. And in lockdown, when the church is shut, we knew we had to take our faith to another level. And at this time, we were attending a, a couple of ministries online and we were um, really prevalent in these meetings and we were getting so much from them. Do you know what I mean? It was faith based. We was in Bible studies. Kevin was there. And, uh, you know, we were kind of like really, you know, really building up our faith in the word of God. And, you know, we were getting seasoned and, and chaperoned and you know all of a sudden things started opening up opening up in in, in our walk and uh we was there for about nine months and <clears throat> we had a uh, a vision uh and god laid a vision on our hearts and here we are you know um you know that that journey in that in, in that ministry really really helped us it really kind of like helped us um we, we, we made some good friends in there we we, we kind of like really um got built up in the faith you know particularly that time in lockdown and after that we went on to you know a crusade we went to daniel chance and you know we we kind of like started going to places where you know places were open and we we didn't did our own thing here we are and that was two years ago um and the lord has completely blessed us he's really kind of like um blessed us in many different things you know um I, I don't know how any of this journey has happened in the last seven years. I haven't done nothing. I can honestly say that my Lord has done everything for me. I've done absolutely nothing. I came here into, in, into my recovery this time as a broken man. I didn't have a clue, but I leaned on God and he made a way. He made a way in every circumstance and every situation. First of all, <clears throat> I should have been sentenced to, you know, at least 10 years. Uh, I, I, I didn't get sentenced. Secondly, um, when he put me into uh, Luton Christian Fellowship, you know, I, um, I found him in a sense that he opened up my heart to him all over again, you know, and, and he baptized me with the Holy Spirit. That was that's when the fire of the Holy Ghost came into me again. I reignited my faith. I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew he, there was someone who could do all this for me. And it was him. And he'd done it for me. He'd done it for me. I said to him, listen, you know, I've been broken, you know, and that scripture, somebody said it on this platform the other day, you know, it was really prevalent, you know, that, that, that he's going to return you know, everything that the locust was stolen. And I said, uh, you know, kind of half believed it you know when i looked at the fruit that was in my life of the the, the the there was there was there was lots of material stuff that was in my life you know and there was lots of stuff that was in my life that were kind of like was fruitful that looked fruitful and i thought ah, you know yeah he's gonna return everything that the locusts are stolen lover yeah really really but god's really different to my really and i believe today as i stand there today i can honestly say that he has returned everything and more and he hasn't even started yet you know i honestly believe and i know he hasn't even started yet you know I, I, i'm 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 54 years of age you know, I've got three beautiful girls under five, right? That was not in my plan when I got clean. In fact, I hanged my book up around children. It was not in my plan when I got clean to have a beautiful wife, you know, again, do you know what I mean? A beautiful wife, you know, who loves me and cares for me, who, who, who would do anything for me, who would die for me, do you know what I mean? That was not in my book, you know, that wasn't in my makeup, but God did it for me. He didn't want me, he, he didn't want, he said, when you tweet, they return everything that the locusts were stolen. You know, these three girls have, have, have sown uh, 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 something in my heart and my life that nothing that... that nothing could change, nothing, nothing. The joy that I get for them three girls is absolutely something that words can't even describe or explain, it can't. The joy that I get from, you know, my relationship with Christ today is, is is nothing short of a miracle because I know when I look back on my life that God's hand has been on my life 
all my life, right away, right, right away back down to when I was a child, to, to that place in that car. I knew he's been on my life because of the things he's taking me through. The addictions, the afflictions, the trauma. That uh, I buried my dad, and 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 I think it was 14, 15 months ago, I buried my mum. I never thought I'd be able to get through that clean. I got through that. I got through those things, and you, you, you know, I, I, and it was the probably the best thing that ever happened. You know, that God showed me again. You know, when it's time, it's time, and you're going to be okay. And it was through the ministry of coming here and, and, and showing and sharing my purpose that enabled me to get through some of these deepest, darkest moments of my life. It was through God that enabled me to get through these challenges. As I said, my, you know, though I walk through the shadow of the valley of death, I will fear no evil because thy rod will comfort me. Psalm 23 has been with me all my life. Psalm 23 has been with me. It's probably one of the, one of the Psalms that I've, 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 I've learned. And I know it's always been with me because God has been with me. He's never left me. He's never forsaken me. He has always been with me. And I know he's with me today. And I just want to share to anyone here, right? No matter what you're going through, no matter where you are, God is with you. And I want to share with you today that if you know that God is with you, who can be against you? Because he is not against you. He is with you. He is with you. He is with us. He is with each and every single one of us. I'm so pleased. I'm so pleased. I'm so pleased in my life today that what God has done for me. And I know, I know for a fact, you know, every time my fears, you know, you see, I'll give you a little fear. You know, people, we talk about fear. One of the fears that come into my life that come in and I need to banish it very quickly. I need to take the thought capture very quickly. Is the love that I have for my girls. You know, Satan, Satan comes in and says, yeah, you're going to die soon. <laughs> it comes in all the times that you're going to die soon. I've got to take these thoughts captive. You're not going to live long to see them grow. I've got to take these thoughts captive. You know, and I and I always I always look at my life to you know uh, some of the Bible characters. I say, well, look at look at Abraham. <laughs> look at when he had a child. Satan, go away. <laughs> Hallelujah. I have to fight these weapons with what God's word. Hallelujah. Because we can't do fear today. You know, there's many, there's many things in my life that's faithful. There's many things in my life that's also fearful. You know, as I'm building my life, I'm in territories that I've never been before. I'm walking in places where I've never, ever been in my life today. And sometimes that road can be narrow. It, it can be narrow. And sometimes, you know, coming off that broad road, as, as Colin always used to say, you know, trying to lean on my own understanding, I have to run back to God very, very, very quickly, because I know today that this renewed character cannot lean on his own understanding, because my track record shows me about my understanding, and what happens to me when I lean on my own understanding, it does not go well. So, if I have God, who is my uh, my provider, who is my healer, who is my deliverer, and I know God, why do I want to lean on my own understanding today? Why do I want to do this? You know, because I've got to keep going to him with my weakness. And that weakness is my rebellious attitude, my rebellious character. I need to keep going to him because I have not arrived. You know, this is why I need to kind of like die to myself daily, because no matter what God gives me, I've got to keep telling myself, you know, you've got more for me. I need to keep going in your strength, in your power. And I cannot afford to lean on my own understanding. And I'm going to leave it there. You know, it's been really, really true. Really, really great sharing this story. I mean, I've had lo there's loads more I could I could tell you. But, you know, that will be the starting point. And no doubt I'll come back and tell you more at a later date. May God bless you. May God keep you. May God continue to shine his face upon you and may God. Kevin, you got your hand up. If you want to come back in the share, please come and raise your hand. Over to you, Kevin. Yeah, thanks, hi, but thanks, brother. I think that's the first time I've heard your testimony, but you know, loads of identification either, loads of identification. Um, you know, even from that early age, that you know, that full flight from reality, um, that delusional thinking. And and I and I felt your pain as well. Do you know what I mean? Um, um, yeah, it just kind of reminded me, you know, like 
he brought me took me back a lot there, Liver, and uh, it was good to hear you. Do you know what I mean? And I've known you a little while now, and um, and I've seen what God's done in your life, and and it, and it, you know, um, <clears throat> yeah, I always felt displaced. I've had, you know, what I mean, I always felt displaced. You know what I mean? Like, um, and uh, obviously, I, my story's similar to yours. Do you know what I mean? I was brought up in a house, and, and my siblings were you know, heavily into the drug scene and um and I found my identity in the in on the streets as well and 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 through that kind of like that became my normal and um you know today I know today that that was abnormal and um and I was in a you know I was kind of but God God's good man do you know what I mean like you know and he, he had to corner me, do you know what I mean? He had to corner me. I, you know, I was like you, I was in the church, you know, and I was still at one foot in the world. And um, and there was a lot of brokenness, do you know what I mean? Very uh, undeveloped in a lot of areas. Um, and, and like you, I've been labelled a lot during my earlier years. And I kind of, you know, it was like me against the world type thinking. And um, and I really thought I could do what I wanted to do. and 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 that all the consequences were just kind of like hazards, hazards. Do you know what I mean? And I would really try my hardest to not uh, get in, uh, go down that road again. And and um, but like you, you know, like when I came back into recovery in 2018, um, you know, I, I recommitted myself to the Lord, and I got opportunities. You know, I walked into the, you know, my was it was a HDB church, an Anglican church. And I was given, a, I was starting to get some responsibilities and I started to be around people again. And, and, uh, and, and I needed that, do you know what I mean? I needed that structure at the beginning, do you know what I mean? You know, the, the formal services, the informal services, do you know what I mean? And, um, but I knew for, you know, I was in recovery at the same time and, you know, and, and you know, half measures devoured me nothing either, do you know what I mean? Three hours in Costas, mate, weren't going to do it, bro, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, and then, you know, when I met you about three years ago, I managed to get a man that was, you know, he, he, you know, he, he knew about what we do in, in, in recovery. But, you know, like, it's like that, it's that delusion, isn't it? When you get clean and sober, you think that's it, don't you? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, you think that's it. Do you know what I mean? It's all right now. Do you know what I mean? And um, he went, nah, Kev, this is where it starts, mate. Do you know what I mean? And, and I had to turn up and I had to show up and... And growing up was painful, mate. Do you know what I mean? Growing up was painful. Do you know what I mean? And and um and you know, but we got in it, didn't we? We got busy. Do you know what I mean? And I started to put in the action. And and God's been graceful to me. He's put some people in my path that have like, you know, really helped me along the way. Do you know what I mean? And no matter what, you know, you know, I can I can either lean on my own understanding. Or I can say, God, get me out of the way. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, because I just want to be you know, be a better person in Christ, in Christ, you know what I mean? Let's have it right, you know, because in Christ we're blessed with every spiritual blessing. You know, I'm, I've got no shame, no guilt, no, no about my past anymore. I know I'm forgiven. Do you know what I mean? I know I'm, I've been washed in the blood. Do you know what I mean? I know I've got a new heart, but now I've got to learn to walk upright. Do you know what I mean? And um, and put in the action. And and we used to hear it all the time. I'm responsible for the action. God's responsible for the outcome. Do you know what I mean? And um, and it has been challenging. It has, you know, things come up all the time now. But I, 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 I am confident. And we can be confident. You know, he started saying in us, you know, and, and we do go through different seasons and, and we get pruned and we get moulded and shaped, you know. And... Um, like you said, you know, I, you know, I've seen where God's done the work in you. Do you know what I mean? And 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 he's, you've you've gone deep. You know what I mean? You're hungering and thirsting for His righteousness. You're seeking His kingdom. And I've been around you as well, Ivor. So I know it's true. Do you know what I mean? I know this stuff works, mate. It's not like I'm just coming in there with my own testimony. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, I've seen this stuff works, man. Do you know what I mean? Because we were the hopeless types. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, and uh, and we don't think like we do. We don't behave, but it's so by grace, and it's, it's and that's the goodness of the Lord. You know what I mean? And His loving kindness leads us to repentance, man. Because what is it? Oh, do you know what? I'm just gonna leave it on this. I woke up, so I've got to go hospital in a little while, yeah. But I've got no fear. I'll tell you why. 
because I woke up this morning, I thought, you know, I'm going to read Psalm 46, I'm going to read Psalm 27, and I'm going to read Matthew 15, right? And that was on the Mount of Transfiguration. Do you know what I mean? And when they when they opened up their eyes, and and God and the Lord said to the Father said to them, listen to my son. Do you know what I mean? Listen to him. That's what he said, right? And and when they opened up their eyes, he went, rise, do not be afraid. Do you know what I mean? And I was like, that's it. You know what I mean? Like get up. You know and um, and we're blessed today, Ivor. You know, it's really good to see where God... And I talk to you now and then, do you know what I mean? And we have a little chat here and now. And, it, you know, it, yeah, he just turns things around. He turns nothing into something, man. Do you know what I mean? And, and it's lovely to hear you today, Ivor. Bless you, brother. Bless you, Kev. Bless you, Kev. Lindsay, over to you, sister. Thank you so much, Tyver. It's so good to hear you today. It's good to hear Kev as well. You know, just, you know, when I when I met you guys in 2021 and uh, I tuned in, I, I, I you know, I, I tuned in here and I thought, this guy's Carl Cox, DJ. Is this <laughs> Carl Cox? <laughs> this DJ that's turned to God. You know, I said, Who, who's this guy? And then, and you know, and then you just opened up your home to me, you know, and picked, arranged for me to get, you know, over the space of like a day, 24 hours, I'm in, I'm in, uh, you know, Luton Airport, you know, get picked up, you know, spend the weekend, you know, you just opened up your home and your heart, you know, you and Gemma and the girls. And, you know, and you're already looking after another brother that's there, you know, another lost sheep brother, you know, Frank, <laughs> and, and, uh, and then, you know, you come down and, you're, and, the, and there's, you know, there, there's fire going off at your convention, you know, there's these fire machines at the front, you know, and, and it's just like, just in love with each other and love with the Lord, you know, and uh, I just want to read, because when you were speaking, when you were speaking, where is it? What I, oh, where is it? Where is it? Right. Let me just read. When you were speaking, your share, what I've, my head was Ephesians 3, 20, 21. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And he's doing exceedingly, exceedingly abundantly, Ivor. God bless. Love you to bits. That Ephesians 3 20 and 21 to him be the glory, amen, amen, hallelujah. It is so good to recognize him, isn't it? Isn't it good to recognize him, our God? Hallelujah, God bless you, Lindsay. It's good to see you and good to see you smiling. You're not on the boat today. I'm in Glasgow for a, a 20 schemes conference that I that I grouped taking the gospel into. The schemes up and down Scotland. So I'm wow. down for the convention in Glasgow. She's in Glasgow. <laughs> God bless you. God bless you. Oh, I love Glasgow. I spent three years living in Rutherglen over there. Loved it. Uh, Barb's over to you. Yeah, morning, Ivar. That was a powerful testimony. I've never actually heard your whole testimony, so that was really powerful. Like um, you can just see the glory of God working from your life. Like I think you know, from the beginning till till now. Like I think He's still working as well. He's still working on you. Like I came to, I came across one scripture which I really like, um, which is um, Romans eight twenty eight. Um, yes. That says, and we know, and we know that those who love God, all things work together for good. Amen. But for those who are called according to His purpose. So, yeah, I just thank God for your life and Amen. I thank God for your journey. Um, yeah, I just want to just, yeah, just praise God and just like, yeah, just give him all the glory because like, um, sorry, I'm just going to, yeah, I'm just getting ready for work. So I'm just, just going to be quite quick. But um, yeah, I just feel like we just need to, um, I, I love what you're doing with your faith ministry, faith walk ministries. As soon as I, I, I came on, I haven't come off because I love um, your ministry and um, it's so wonderful how God can turn people's lives around. And some of your past resonates with me as well. Like I had come from a broken home, um, no love. And then as soon as Jesus touched you, your, your life is um, turned around. So thank you so much for sharing. And um, yeah, 
That's what I want to share. Yeah, thank you. Amen. Amen. Beautiful, Pops. Beautiful, Sister Bob. Love you too. Love you too. I love that scripture as well. Romans 8 28. You girls, you girls gave me some good scriptures there, man. They're so prevalent and the ones that I love as well because it's so true. Do you know what I mean? It's like the Bible is true. God's mm -hmm. word is true. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Confirmation of God's word here. Hallelujah. Thank you, sisters. Absolutely beautiful. You, you guys are truly blessed. Cotton, over to you. Hi there. Can't hear you. I can hear you now. Now you've gone again. You've gone. I can't hear you. 